Well, when did the great controversy begin, before or after creation? Before. When did law come to the attention of God's intelligent beings throughout the universe? At Sinai? In Eden? Yes, and Ellen White has the stunning statement that it came to the angels as something unthought of that there should be any law. Because before sin came in, there was no need to say to angels, you know, don't kill or don't steal or don't commit adultery or, or however it was expressed to them then in an appropriate way. The law as we have it is phrased for our needs, our human needs. How do you tell an angel don't commit adultery? But the law of God, the basic law of love, which is the law of life, began to be enunciated to the angels. And it came to them as a surprise there should be any law, because before then they did what was right because it was right. It was natural for them to do what was right. But then when sin came in, God began to enunciate these laws, to describe um, the kind of living that was acceptable in his universe and was required for continued freedom throughout his universe. At Sinai, it was enunciated in the way that we know as the Ten Commandments. They could all be summed up in the law of love, couldn't they, actually? But the law of love and life was tailored to our needs. To hurt us? To confuse us? Or because we needed the law? What has been the effect of the law in your own life? Now, not just the Ten Commandments, but all God's laws, all his rules and regulations. How about laws about health and a lot of other things? How about laws on the highway? Does the um, highway department uh, put up stop signs just to show the authority of the city fathers and to deprive us of our freedom, just to show that there's somebody in authority there, so they put up stop signs here and there around town? Or do they put the stop signs at busy intersections to keep us from killing ourselves? Now, it's a nuisance to have them there, but have you ever tried exercising your freedom in a busy intersection? and just barrel right through and you die right there defending your right of way. Well, it's like the man bailing out at 20,000 feet and the law, the law of the sergeant on the ground begins to annoy him and he thinks, I've been told all this time I have to pull the ripcord and that has annoyed me so. This time I will exercise my freedom and I will not pull the ripcord. And a little later he hits the ground and he's lost his freedom forever. Wouldn't he be much wiser to pull the ripcord and remain free to fly again another day? That law was not to deprive him of his freedom, but to help him keep his freedom. How have you found the laws of God? Don't we do this with a little child? When he's tiny, we not only tell him, don't run out on the road, you might get run over by a truck. He's not even old enough to understand that. We even put him in a playpen to deprive him of his freedom well, it's quite a sight to see a little child rattling the, the bars of his playpen wanting to get out, you know. He feels this infringement. Are you being cruel to put him in there? Shouldn't you honor his freedom and put him right out there on the sidewalk, tell him you're free, you're responsible, you can think it through, you're mature, little one and a half year old, you can play on the street if you want. What kind of a parent is that? Did not God, in his concern for his people, lest they lose their freedom prematurely before they're old enough to use it aright and responsibly. Did he not at the foot of Sinai, for that's one of the great climactic moments in history, did he not put his people in a great playpen there and surround them with rules and regulations, not to deprive them of their freedom, but to protect them from all the things that might hurt them? And to continue the picture, for me, he not only put them in this playpen to protect them, these rules and regulations, but he even prepared a sandbox for them. And he put a little toy tabernacle in it, as it were. I mean, compared with what's in heaven, it was just like what we use in cradle roll, wasn't it? And here were little cardboard priests and altars and all these other things. Sometimes we think what's in heaven is just like that. It's infinitely greater than that. Not denying God might use visual aids for the other beings in the universe, but heaven's a uh, temple is so great that 10,000 times 10,000 can gather there and watch the investigative judgment. Heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? I want heaven to be adequate for our infinite God. But the message comes through, doesn't it, from the sandbox? 
Some people want to spend the rest of their lives in the playpen, playing at the sandbox. And they prefer the voice of authority from the mountain. They feel more secure with this. And Paul says, it grieves me to find several years later that you're still there, cowering in your playpen, waiting for somebody to tell you what to do, still children, easily swayed, and swung to and fro by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, with their ingenuity in inventing error. By now, he says, you should have grown up. In Hebrews, you remember, have your faculties trained by practice to distinguish good from evil. We were never intended to stay there in the playpen at the sandbox. Now, our church advanced from the sandbox, didn't it, when it read Hebrews and put it with Leviticus. We came to see the larger view. But sometimes we still get preoccupied with the details rather than this great truth about God answering these questions, these charges, these accusations before the presence of the whole universe. Sometimes we make the investigative judgment almost a sort of a, an accounting procedure. God is dealing with real people who have real questions as our cases are presented one by one before our future neighbors and friends. And Satan accuses us and Christ defends us. This is for real and it's very gripping. That's what the sandbox represented. We're supposed to grow up as Elijah did when he finally realized that God wanted to talk to him as a still small voice. Moses grew up and God could talk to him face to face as a man speaks to his friend directly. And by and by Jesus could talk plainly to the disciples, you remember? Now he said, I'll tell you about the Father plainly and not in parables. Was it gracious of God in the days of our ignorance and our immaturity to put us in the playpen and surround us with all these rules and regulations? Even to tell us, don't kill people, you know, don't steal, don't commit adultery, etc. Do you have to be told that now? Is this why tonight we won't go and murder somebody on the way home or break into a store on the way home? Or have you come to the place where you don't even want to do it and fulfill the Tenth Commandment? Don't we long for the day when we won't even have the desire to sin? So as I understand it, God, as it were, gradually lowers the walls around the playpen. And if we're grown up enough, he turns us loose. Can you name a character who had no playpen around him? It wasn't Job like that? Yes, we could name a number of others. I understand the last generation will not be protected by the playpen. Does this mean that we do away with the law? Does the law still have a function? Well, unfortunately, we still act sometimes as if we need the playpen, don't we? Shame on us. But we still need the law. Who wants to do away with all playpens? To the extent that we're still immature, we need them. And the rising generation needs them. Now, when a person is mature and steps out of his playpen, now does, he, now does he begin to act irresponsibly and rebelliously like a little child? No, Paul says, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I acted like a child, but now that I've grown up, I act like a man. What chapter is that in? <coughs> First Corinthians 13. All right, what's the description of a man? He loves. He's never rude. He's never arrogant. He never boasts. He never insists on having his own way. He's never even irritable. He never rejoices at wrong. Why, that's the keeping of the Ten Commandments, isn't it? Love is the fulfilling of the law. The mark of a grown-up person who's ready to step out of his playpen is that he keeps the Ten Commandments. For love is the fulfilling of the law. Except the Sabbath. Isn't that the one that doesn't seem to fit all the time because it seems arbitrary? But as for the rest of it, doesn't it seem clear then that the only man who doesn't need the protection of the law is the man who's keeping it perfectly. Doesn't need his playpen. So Paul says in Romans 3.31, does faith abolish law? God forbid, faith establishes law. Because those of us who regard God with gratitude, love, wonder, admiration for his wise and gracious ways, understand God's use of law, which he added in our behalf. And we, folk of faith, confirm the goodness of the law. And so it says, faith establishes law by putting it in its proper perspective. 
Did God give us the law to deprive us of our freedom or to keep us from losing our freedom prematurely before we were old enough to use it aright? Now, since God does not wish to be seen as legalistic and arbitrary, since God knew that Satan loves to picture him as legalistic and arbitrary, did not God run a serious risk every time he added another law? He knew he needed these laws. Therefore, he was willing to run the risk and he added law upon law. As we went on misbehaving, more laws to protect us. Since God doesn't want to be seen as legalistic, was it not gracious of him to run this risk by giving us the laws that we needed? Now, who is it in the world today reads the Bible and uh, considers these laws as legalistic and obedience to them as legalistic? But our fellow Christians, that's an odd thing, isn't it? Isn't it odd that it is our fellow Christians, even the very close ones to us, that want to throw away at least part of these laws? Whereas it seems to me that the one who accepts Christ and accepts Jesus' message, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, and accepts Jesus' message, if you knew the truth, the truth would set you free. Also is prepared to understand how such a gracious God could make such use of law. And Jesus said, I haven't come to destroy the Old Testament, the law and all, I've come to explain it.